Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here in your church this morning. Uh, my name is Sebastian Tiro. The brother tried very well, and uh, I don't blame him. <laughs> uh, this is the easiest uh, translation of my Romanian name, uh, which is much more difficult than what you hear in English, but um, still a lot of people have trouble. My name in Romanian means the bad mosquito. I truly believe that's why God calls me to go as a missionary to the jungles of this world because there's no more mosquito, worse mosquito than I am already. That's why I think uh, malaria avoided me for all these years. Um, I am a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I, I pastored uh, a couple of churches in Montana, United States, and uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, uh, until 2001. In 2001, I went as a full-time missionary for the remote tribes around the world, uh, a work that I started with my friend Dan Serb in 1996 in the Kalahari Desert, Southern Africa. Um, right now, we, we lead a missionary organization in Canada called Pilgrim Society that is called to reach only the, the most remote places on the earth. Uh, for the past 12 years, we've been doing this, uh, starting with the Kalahari Desert, Congo Pygmies, South American Amazon, the Arctic Inuit of the North Pole, uh, and some other very remote places around the world. We are also, uh, I am uh, the coordinator for Remote Tribes uh, Ministries in It Is Written United States and a partner with It Is Written Oceania, the new ministry that you have here in Australia. Uh, we partnered with all these people to um, reach some of the most untouched cultures in the world. Uh, it started as a, as a dream uh, we were third-year uh, theology students in Cape Town, South Africa. We, uh, by origin, we come from Romania. Um, we both come from different backgrounds. I came from an atheist family of philosophy professors. Both my father and mother are philosophy and history professors, now retired, that uh, educated us in the non-existence of God up to the age of 22 years old. Up to the age of 22, I did everything that a young man can do. I was a rock and roll singer. I had long hair, cut jeans, soldier boots, nose rings. I had painted hair. I, had, I was a vocalist and a guitar player in a, in a rock band. I was a professional dancer with my sister, Daniela. Professional dancer in nightclubs of Romania for about 16 years. I smoked, I drank, I was a fighter. I uh, was a professional soldier at the age of, age of 14 years old where for three years they beat me up in all sorts of uh, training facilities. That's what we call in Romania, training. Uh, they, will call, uh, they, will call, they will call us soldiers. At the age of 17, my brother fled the country to Sweden illegally, and I was imprisoned on his behalf by the communist Romania. They said, um, if one of, you, one of your family runs away, the next of kin has to take the punishment but somebody has to take the punishment. Therefore, at the age of uh, 19, I was put in a special political military unit, they called us. It's called in Romania disciplinary battalion. It's worse than a prison. I've done prison ministries in the United States and, and Canada, and I want to tell you that civilization here in North America or Western, uh, Western society do not have prisons, they have hotels. People have rights, they dress nicely, two people in a cell, you play basketball or you watch color TVs, you can go to church if you want to inside your prison. We were 34 people in one cell for 18 months, no running water. We were beaten about six or seven times a day, starved to death, worked like slaves for 18 months. After 18 months, I decided that all my life I was a good man trying to fit in the society. I decided that I'm gonna become a rebel Maybe I'll have a better life. That's why I became a rock and roll singer, professional dancer, and so forth. At the age of 22, I was a history teacher, if you can believe that, looking like that. I was teaching history in grades 5 to 8, uh, 10 to 15-year-old kids, how to become good citizens. My nickname in the school was The Beast, because I had long hair, long beard. I was looking like that. But in one of my grade 5 classes, a 10-year-old girl looked at me by faith. A 10-year-old Seventh-day Adventist girl who came to me, gave me the Bible, and she said, 
you are teaching us about the rise and fall of Roman Empire and Babylon and all this. I would like to show you who created all this and who's in charge of this universe. A 10-year-old girl knew exactly who she believed in and how she would present that God to me. I got a Bible from her just to not, to be polite. I went home, and in the cover of the Bible, she gave me the first two issues of the Revelation seminars that were going on around at that time. I went home and I started to study. I didn't have anything to do that afternoon. In less than an hour, when I finished the second seminar, something happened in my heart. Something very strange that I couldn't explain. I just could not do what I did before without having problems with my conscience, which I never had before. So in less than two weeks, I went back to this girl the next day and I said to her, listen, I know there are 24 issues of the Revelation seminars. If by tomorrow morning they're not on my desk in my office, you will flunk history this quarter. <laughs> That's how a great teacher I was. The poor girl came, go, went around the town that evening and found all the 22 numbers of Revelation seminars. And she brought me the next day at school these seminars together with two thick books, The Great Controversy in Desire of Ages. This is a 10-year-old girl who knew exactly how to reel people in. <laughs> in two weeks, I studied almost day and night. My, my parents did not understand what happened to me. They chased me out of the, of the house and they said, we cannot believe that there is a force in this universe who can change you in two weeks while we tried for 22 years. So in two weeks, I found out there is a Seventh-day Adventist church in town. I went there not knowing that although it changed that heart, I was still looking like the beast. I came to church, the pastor preached the sermon, and at the end of the sermon, he made an altar call. This was a very, very good traditional pastor who would make an altar call after every sermon. And he made an altar call, whoever would like to be baptized, just come, come forth. And I stood up and I went forth. And I want you to imagine for a second the face of this pastor looking at me, never saw me in his life, and suddenly I want to be baptized. And he said, sir, we don't know if you have a relationship with Christ. We don't know who you are. We'd like to know if you have a strong friendship with God. And I said, yes, sir, I do. You may not see it, but he does. <laughs> so they baptized me on 31st of May, 1992. I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I quit my job as a teacher immediately. And I, I knelt and I said, Lord, I know you have a plan. I know you have a plan because you did not bring me from this darkness into your light with no purpose. So while I was researching and studying what to do, somebody gave me a book called The, the Life of David Livingston. They broke my heart. That a man in 1800s could walk 19,000 kilometers to preach the gospel in the darkest Africa. And we are now in 21st century, and we don't do as much as he did in 1800s. So I said, if he did that by foot, I think I can do the same by car. So I decided to become a missionary. I went down south, I became a theology student in Romania and Bucharest to our, our institute there, theological seminary. I met Dan. We are friends for 16 years right now. He was the first man I met there. He was the youngest in our, one of the youngest in our classes. I was one of the oldest. We became very good friends. In 1996, we left Romania for Africa to become missionaries. We had no idea where we were going. We had no money, no friends, no relatives, nobody waited for us. We had absolutely no connection with anybody in Africa. Yet, yet, God had a plan. I'd like to read to you a text from Romans 15, verse 20 and 21. This is the principle of our mission to remove tribes to, uh, uh, from the beginning. Romans 15, verse 20 and 21 says, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. It was our aim to preach the gospel in no man's land. Because God died for all on this planet. No matter how they look, no matter how they live, no matter what they, they live, no matter what they do. Jesus died for them as well. Therefore, in 1996, Dan and I, we left from Romania to continue our studies of theology in Cape Town, South Africa, and we continued as missionaries deep into the Kalahari Desert, Southern Africa, where the Bushmen, you heard of the Bushmen tribe? 
They are called also the Sand Tribe. How many of you have seen a movie called The Gods Must Be Crazy? <laughs> Australia watches TV. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> That's a very good movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Because the Bushman that played in that movie, you're going to see him in just a few minutes here. He was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian in July 2000. And uh, we went deep into the Kalahari to work with these wonderful people. The sand people are not black, are not white. They're semi-pygmies. They're shorter, not very short as the pygmies of Congo, not very tall. They are yellowish, brown in color. They have different features than any other tribe in Africa. And they are considered the oldest tribe on the planet. Oldest living culture in the world. They are the Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert. They live in tremendous conditions of minus 5 degrees at night to plus 40 during the day. They, have, they are hunters and gatherers. They go from place to place and they find food by hunting. They live in grass huts uh, and uh, many of them have absolutely no wealth at all. This is their master bedroom. If you ever think your master bedroom is too small, <laughs> think of the Bushmen of the Kalahari. They sleep outside. This is a master bedroom of a family. They do not sleep in the huts because they like to see the stars above their heads every night. Very independent, very free people. Bushmen, they were put in prison by the government of Botswana or Namibia in Africa, died of starvation and thirst because they will not eat or drink until they see the stars again above their heads. It is an amazing culture. Those of you that have seen the movie, this is the God Must Be Crazy actor. I had the privilege of baptizing him in July 2000. His name was Gaukana. He died in July 2003 of TB, becoming one of the first people to die in the Lord in the Kalahari Desert. It was an amazing spirit, and um, every year that we go there, we started to preach the gospel very simply. Dan and I, when we got there as, as theology students, we had two backpacks, few, uh, a, little, a little money in our pocket for food, and we had no idea what we're doing there. But I think God uses our blindness to take us to a place so He can use us. If we would know all the problems from the beginning, we would never go in the mission field. So that's why God just keeps us blind. So we go there. When we go there, we have to depend on Him for everything. Because we realized when we got to the Kalahari, we don't speak the language. The Kalahari Bushmen speak a language called the Jun Nuansi Bushmen uh, language. The Jun Nuansi, it's a clicking language. It's a very difficult to understand. It's an unwritten language. How do you spell how do you put it on the paper? <laughs> it's very tough. Therefore, we, we are in the middle of a culture that we don't know. We don't know how to preach the gospel, but we said, Lord, give us a man. Give us somebody who we can translate through and preach the gospel. And the Lord gave us a man, not only a man that speaks English, but a man that speaks 14 languages. A man that we call primitive speaks 14 languages. A man that, could, uh, that uh, in the past 12 years came with us to many villages and many places and uh, preached with us. Uh, then slowly, as we continue to preach and come back, I've been in the Kalahari 36 times in the past 12 years. In 1998, they adopted me as a bushman myself. My name in the Kalahari is not Sebastian, it's Kao, Po Kamwanga. Kao means the white chief, Po means the jackal, and Kamwanga means the white tall beast. <laughs> I got very upset with them. I said uh, to the chief, I said, but I was called the beast before I was a Christian. Why do you call me beast after? I said, but look at you how you look. It takes a whole day to feed, to feed you. <laughs> That's how big I am next to them. Then slowly as we continue to preach, results would come up because the word of God never comes back empty. So we, had, we purchased this pool, baptismal pool, plastic, and we, we started to baptize these people. You have to realize a, a very important thing here. The bushmen of the Kalahari never wash because there's no water to wash. In the Kalahari Desert, there is no surface water. These people die of thirst. I've never understood what thirst is until I got to the Kalahari Desert. These people wake up in the morning, they, they break blades of grass with dew drops on them to rub between their lips so they will not die of thirst that day. I don't know if you're aware of this, but 20,000 children under 12 years old every single day die because they have no water. Not malaria, no AIDS, no TB, no crime, just because they have no water to drink. I never understood what that is until I got there. So a lot of these people, they walk 20 kilometers to find one liter, two liters of water. And a lot of people ask me, why don't they wash? And I said, if I would walk 20 kilometers for one liter of water, I wouldn't wash either. I would just drink it. 
So suddenly I put them in a baptismal pool all the way to their waist, and I tell them that the symbol of baptism is you die, and you wake up in the Lord again, a new man. Some of them take it literally. I had people who said to everybody before I put them in the baptismal pool, hey, it's been nice to know you. Pastor Sebastian will kill me now, <laughs> but I'll come back. Some of them trust me to that extent. Some of them don't. Some of them try to stay halfway dry, and they just lift a hand. Or when I put them under a foot, they lift up, and they show everybody I'm still there. I'm okay. <laughs> Every year we come back, and we preach the gospel. We baptize people. We build churches. We start to create an infrastructure in the Kalahari as to this day, we have right now 2,500 people worshiping in the Kalahari Desert in a place where they were worshiping spirits before. And now we have churches. We go in and baptize people in any conditions. And you can see here very, very little water up to our ankles, but these people are so tiny, you baptize them in any quantity. Some of them that are a little bigger, we had to create waves to cover them. Because the Bible says you have to put them under water. It doesn't matter what it is. We go ahead and we baptize these people. And we, uh, right now, not only that we preach the gospel, but we improve their quality of life. A true missionary of the Bible never just say God loves you and let them starve to death. Jesus himself did not do that. Jesus himself fed them, uh, uh, healed them, and then he preached, he preached the gospel to them. That's what we do right now. We plant gardens for these people, and I'm going to tell you why we plant gardens in just a second. We build churches. We give them a place to worship, a place that we can come and call home, and they can come on Sabbath, and we go from village to village, and we're, right now we have six full Seventh-day Adventist villages in the Kalahari that we are building churches for them. But the second greatest miracle we, we were able to see in their life is to give them fresh water to drink. The Kalahari Desert has the largest underground lake on the planet. 200 feet underground, 60 meters under your feet. Although these people die of thirst, there is the, what, what they call the dragon's breath. Uh, a, a lake 800 square miles in, in diameter, in a huge cave under the Kalahari with fresh, pure water without purification or filtration necessary. So what we do is we bring these solar systems Solar power system with submersible pumps. We put the pump down on the ground, 200 feet, and we pull up fresh water, cold water from underground. These people now not only have water to drink, they have water to bathe. By the way, we surround these systems, as you can see here, with big uh, rock fences because our greatest enemy in the Kalahari are the elephants. They come and smell the water. They, they can see it's there, but they can't take it out. They get very upset and destroy everything in their path. That's why we protect the systems with rock walls, and we also plant the gardens inside the walls so animals don't come in. Now they have water to bathe, water to wash, water to drink, water to feed the animals, water to water their gardens. Their life is improved. We estimate that at least uh, uh, between 25 and 30,000 people drink water now from our systems in the Kalahari Desert. 75 water systems powered by the sun. The Bushmen still don't understand how you can come in the morning with a bucket, push the button, and the sun gives power to the water underneath to come up and fill their buckets. But all, they don't need to know the, all the details. All they need to know is that that water is theirs, and they can use it. It's an amazing miracle to see these people bringing their children at night to wash at the wells. All the children and all the mothers come every night and, and wash them out. That's how happy they are to have these water systems. It's, uh, we have right now 186 villages of Bushmen in the Kalahari and we want to fill them all with water systems. If we finish this tribe to give them water, I believe that's one of the greatest blessings we can give to these people besides giving the, uh, preaching the gospel. We have missionaries from all over the place. Uh, every year they come with us to, uh, to help us build the churches, preach the gospel, distribute blankets and food and so forth. Um, this is our workhorse in the Kalahari. I need to tell you that we have beaten the Guinness Book of Records of how many people can go in one car. I, we had 35 Bushmen in this car. I took, I took my car to pick 12 people for baptism in one village, and the chief said, we all want to come. And I said, I can't put, them, put, put you all. You're too many. You're 35 people. And uh, in, in my car, I said, only nine people can fit. And they said, no, no, nine people your size. <laughs> Let us show you how, much, how many we can get in. So when they squeezed in, I had 16 in the boot alone. 
You don't want to know how they looked, but there was, a, there was a mangle of feet and faces all together. It doesn't matter. Uh, my entire car looked like a porcupine on wheels. 35 people, when I came to the village, the whole village said Sebastian went uh, somewhere astray because he's destroying his car. But their car is a, is a tool for preaching the gospel. We go from place to place. And the greatest blessing that we have seen lately in the past two years is a small technological miracle. What we call an MP3 player. You see, we try to give the Bible to these people, but this, the Bible is not written in the language. They don't write or read, and you cannot really translate the Bible in clicking language. So what we did is we had a bushman that spoke the Bible from Genesis to Revelation on 99 cassette tapes. He spoke it in bushman language. Then we put it on tapes. Then we took tape players and batteries and take it to the bushman villages. But this was a, a disaster because when the batteries are finished, all the tapes were thrown in the desert and all sorts of bad things happen. Two years ago, it is written, found a company in Ireland who makes these MP3 players who are wrongly called God pods, in my opinion. You cannot put God in a pod. It's MP3 players. But these MP3 players are solar powered. No batteries, no electricity. You put them six hours in the sun, they play for six hours. We put the entire Bible digitally on this MP3 player the size of a cassette tape. We put the Steps to Christ book in there, and we put 27 Bible studies in there in Bushman language. Right now, 2,700 units have been distributed to the Kalahari Bushman. And let me tell you this. I had experiences in which I was driving through the bush far in the desert, and I saw a Bushman hunter in his loincloth, and with a bow and arrow, barefoot, going hunting, and at his waist, he had the MP3 player with headphones listening to the Bible. <laughs> this is what I call preaching the gospel to the end of the world. Because if God's word cannot come in the form of a book, God's word will come in any form just to reach the people of this planet. So we move on from this, and this becomes the greatest, <coughs> the greatest um, possession they have. I moved the village of 35 people in four and a half minutes. That's how much they have. I, I built them a new village with a new water system. I came to the chief and I said, when can I come to pick you up to move you to the new village? He said, right now, we're ready. 35 people in four and a half minutes picked up their ostrich egg shell for water, bow and arrow, and their family. And they stood up in my truck and I took them to the new village. I was wondering, my wife was next to me, and she said, how much would it take us to move? <laughs> if we have to move right away. Can we pack in four and a half minutes? You see, Ellen White says that in the end time, all we will have is our faith in God and no baggage. <laughs> the question is, when are we willing to drop them? Um, we have doctors and dentists that come every year with us and help, and we continue this mission to a point where right now we have missionaries in their place, we have churches, we have local pastors, we train local leaders to take over the work and move on. But this work was just the beginning of a greater vision that God has shown us because remote tribes live to the end of the world. Therefore, my next, my next trip was in the Amazon. I spent three years in the Amazon working in Venezuela, Guyana, and Brazil, establishing churches, building schools, and working with a missionary called David Gates. I believe he was at this church, right? Now, after coming back from the Amazon, I discovered that they are very remote people on the top of the world. And in 2005, I made the mistake, according to the world, to go to the North Pole. I had no idea about my equipment. I had no idea about how cold can get. I was completely unprepared. When I got off the plane in the Arctic, the first Inuit that saw me, Inuit, Inuk person that saw me, looked at me. This is, this is me, by the way. I looked in my normal clothes. And he said, in your clothes, you'll never survive here. So they put their wives to, to, sue me a, to sew me a special suit from polar bear, caribou, and seal fur so I can survive. Under these pants here, I had five pairs of pants. <laughs> so if you think you're cold, try and go to the Arctic. <laughs> Minus 60 degrees Celsius. I don't know if Australians understand what that is. <laughs> But at minus 60 degrees, they've done tests. If you drink, I, I was drinking hot tea from my little gas bottle, 
And I, it was boiling when I took it in my hand. I took two sips and I had to throw it away because it was freezing. Your eyelashes freeze as you blink at minus 60 degrees Celsius. If you keep your mouth open more than three minutes, your teeth start cracking. And people say, how do people survive there? Quite happily, actually. They give birth in their place. They sleep in their place. They 12 months a year, they, they live in their place. Uh, the harshest environment I've ever been in in my life was the Arctic in the North Pole. These people live in six months of darkness, six months of light. When we, when we landed, you could see the curvature of the planet from the plane. And the pilot said, welcome to the end of the world. Literally. These people don't know what an orange look like, looks like, an apple looks like, or a tree looks like. They have never seen a plant in their life. They eat raw meat 12 months a year. Seal, whale, polar bear, and fish. They don't know how to cook their food. And they live in extreme conditions. There's no diseases there, there's no insects, there's no snakes, there's no scorpions, but the cold is enough for everything. It will kill you. When I got there in the first year, I slept in igloos with them, I distributed Bibles in their own language. They said the only tribe that I've seen, a remote tribe, that can read and write and have a developed language, and they teach their children how to read and write in their language. It's called Inuktitut language. Canadian Bible Society translated the Bible in their language. We bought a couple of hundred of them in the first year. I went there, distributed them, and I prayed for 5,000 Bibles to give to these people. And it is written, came in and sponsored 5,000 Bibles. Right now, every home in the Arctic have a Bible in their own language to read about God. We have missionaries that live there right now. Uh, last year, I went with my friends from It Is Written, Sean Boonstra and a couple of other friends, by dog sled, of course, all of our travel in the Arctic is by dog sled. Uh, 14 to 16 dogs, you cannot, you cannot survive without these dogs. We would sleep in igloos of minus 60 degrees, and the dogs sleep outside in the ice, covered with the, with the uh, windy snow that comes over them. These dogs semi-hibernate every night. I don't know if you know about this, but a dog in the Arctic drops its heart rate to four beats per minute to be able to survive the cold of minus 60. Amazing animals that may helped us survive. And uh, of course, it's not a pretty, pretty job when you go there. In order to survive in the Arctic, you need 8,000 calories per day to eat, to make the same amount of heat that you need to heat up your body. 8,000 calories, you know what that means? 35 McDonald's burgers every day. Imagine your, your liver. And I was eating cereal bars that gave me 1,200 calories per day. I was wasting every single day. In two and a half weeks, I lost 29 kilograms. If you want to lose weight, come with me to the Arctic. <laughs> you can eat anything you can imagine there, you still lose weight. It's the greatest diet I've ever been on. Now I know. Every time I go, I, 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 I go very fat, so I have a, a place to lose it from. And uh, it's much better. Then every cup of water that you drink, you need to, to melt 10 liters, uh, um, uh, 5 liters of water every single day. Every single cup of water, 5 liters of, of snow to melt. You need 10 cups of water a day. Uh, many, many things that we take for granted, we don't even think here, becomes a great pain in the Arctic. Imagine when you have 5 pairs of pants, 5 pullovers, 5 pairs of socks. 3 pairs of pants have suspenders. And it's minus 60 outside, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, you sleep in an igloo, it blows 100 miles an hour winds, and you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> My guide, the Inuit hunter, looked at me, and I, he saw me sweating. I was really getting desperate. And he looked at me and said, what's the problem? I said, I need to go out. And he said, well, you have two choices. We use the igloo together, no problem, or you get out. I chose to get out, and I was very sorry. I'm going to leave that to the rest of your imagination. I'm not going to go into details. <laughs> it's a very hard, it's a very hor horrific experience. Then we went in deeper into the, into the Arctic. And uh, of course, uh, last year, Sean and I delivered uh, Bibles there. Right now, as I said, we have two missionaries that work there. We deliver Bibles to uh, <clears throat> many villages around. Uh, they live, although the government builds them trailer, trailer homes, they still live. 30 or 40 people per ho home because there's no, not enough homes for everybody. And in the Arctic, you cannot be homeless. You die. Everybody needs to live somewhere. Therefore, uh, the, the, they have the highest suicide rate in the world because of the depression. 
because of lack of vitamin D. Six months of darkness will affect your brain. And then uh, the food affects them as well. The understanding of life and so forth. Uh, but these people are very welcoming, very friendly. They accepted us like friends. We gave them Bibles. We preached to them. We talked to them. And they, from village to village, the news is spread that some white people are here to deliver Bibles. After they left last year, I continued alone deeper north to go with two other guides uh, uh, deep to other villages uh, close to northern Greenland by dog sled. And let me tell you this. If you ever have a romantic have read in the books about dog sled expeditions and you have a romantic view, within one hour you're going you're gonna to lose that romantic view of dog sledding. Because when you bump yourself up in the icebergs for about six or ten hours a day and you sit on a hard sled and it's, it's cold outside and it freezes your face and you're thirsty and you're hungry and you're cold and you can't get warm, if you work too much or run too much, you sweat on your spine and that sweat freezes on your spine, and then you're finished. You cannot warm up again. So all the romantic view, it's in the book. <laughs> when you get there, you realize reality is different, and you, you get to, uh, to this point. That's how you look when you go there. This is a, a nice day. The guide was telling me, oh, it's, it, it feels like spring. It was only minus 42. And I said, spring to you. Uh, this guy's at minus 25 degrees Celsius. They take their jackets off. Because for them, it's a beautiful thing. A minus 25 in Australia, I think half a population will die. In New York, at minus 10, and they shut down the roads because it's very bad. Right here, this is our igloos that we sleep in. Uh, uh, this is a permanent igloo that we sleep in. Of course, you don't sleep in an igloo. It's just a trance. You go in there, and uh, you just almost fall asleep because it's cold. Your, your snow melts behind your back here and you can't take your clothes off to change, and you sit in the same clothes for three weeks or four weeks or five weeks, as long as you're there. Every time I come home, my wife from the gate, from the, from the front gate, she says, stay there, take your clothes off, throw them away, then you come in the house. <laughs> because after five weeks of living in the same clothes, guess what? Things happen. There's some of our guides. Lunch that we have on the trail as a missionary, you have to be careful not to offend the local culture, but at the same time, not to compromise your lifestyle. It's very, very thin, thin line you're walking on, but I have to refuse them their seals and their muktak, their whale skin and their polar bear feet and so forth. But once in a while, they gave me raw fish, and I accept that, and I eat it. It's, how can I say this? Interesting. <laughs> it's ice cream with fishy taste. That's what it is. <laughs> it's cold, it's frozen and you just have to eat it. Okay? Now, I'm going to invite my friend Dan up. We have been working, uh, we have been praying and, and planning for, to reach the Congo pygmies of the Congo jungle in, in Africa for about five years now. We've been praying for the civil war to end. It's tremendous destruction in their place. And we have been praying to God to give us this blessing to see the smallest people on the planet with the greatest hearts. Uh, we don't know how many there are in the Congo jungle. Nobody knows the exact number. They estimate between 600,000 and a million and a half pygmies in the Congo jungle. They are decimated by the rebels right now in Congo because they believe their, their pygmy flesh is magic. And in order to win the war, they have to eat the pygmies. And they dis dis destroy them in great numbers. The Lord has great plans for these people. As you're going to hear and see now, we have tremendous advancement into the work of God in Congo. And I'm going to invite, uh, I'm going to invite um, Pastor Dan to come up. Uh, he is a pastor from Cape Town, South Africa. Been a pastor for 11 years there. And now fully involved with our mission to the remote tribes. Dan. Good morning, everyone. I would have loved to continue to listen to you speaking about this, uh, this mission. Um, I'd also like to just read something very quickly, and uh, I'll tell you a few things that I think are quite important uh, just before we go into this mission, and then we'll go very briefly over this, and Sebastian will, will, will close. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is one of our, of our uh, the chapters that define the ministry that we, that we do. And I'd just like to read the last three verses, which I think sums up uh, more or less um, the mission. 
I'd like to give you a chance to find it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The entire chapter brings so, so much more to the table, that, but I just wanted to, to focus on these last three verses, which I think are very important. Sebastian has not gone into much detail of the hardships. And as he mentioned about the trip in, uh, in, at the, in the Arctic, you know, very often when you speak about missionary work, it, it sounds very romantic. It sounds very, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, just a, a big adventure. And it is a big adventure with God. Um, at times, we are afflicted. We go through things. Sebastian almost lost his life in the Arctic in an igloo. He got lost in the storm. Um, Two of the missionaries that are involved in this, including myself, have contracted malaria. That's not a romantic uh, uh, thing at all. And uh, cars that we've been in in the Congo, we're not going to go into details, have been ambushed. Uh, but we praise God because every single time that we go through something like that, we know that this is not our work. You see, if, if the devil was just to be concerned with Sebastian and Dan as individuals, I don't think he would have much to, do, to deal with. But he knows that God's power is behind us. And he knows that God will continue to do the work. And every single time we are afflicted, we know that uh, someone is not happy, but we also know that the power that is behind us is greater, and it will continue to, to, to move us forward. Uh, Sebastian has spoken about, has made an introduction as far as I'm, uh, about myself. I'd just like to mention something, because probably there are some of you that can identify with this story. Um, the moment I met Sebastian, I was very taken by his story and uh, where he comes from. How many of you are born in the church? Well, I've got some news for you. None of you are actually born in the church. You know, this is one of those expressions that we use. We know what it means, but it's not uh, we are born at the hospital, uh, most probably. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I was born in the church. And uh, <laughs> I was always the shy one, the skinny one, and the one that uh, the beasts of my neighborhood were beating up. And it's so interesting how God calls people from different walks of life, with different experiences, brings them together, and, and then He has a purpose for them. You see, I, I have discovered that it is a wonderful thing to listen to this kind of conversion stories that Sebastian has had, and the change is visible, and it marks them for the rest of their lives. Well, you... If you are born in the church and you go through the motions, I was baptized when I was 19 because my friends were being baptized. You know, my mom was saying, hey, man, what's going on? Aren't you also going to go through the water? Oh, yeah, okay, let's go through the water. Soccer and the books were my passion. Religion wasn't really my interest. I would go to church on Sabbath because otherwise I'd feel guilty. And I think it's very important that every single one of us understand, as far as our, our children are concerned, as far as the youth is concerned, that we need to, to do something to also encourage them to have a conversion experience. Amen. Otherwise, we might have churches where, you know, these youth, this youth, let's pray they don't go out. But if they stay in, sometimes we might be under the illusion that, all right, they, they, they are in here and they've been baptized. Maybe it's time for them to become a deacon. All right, and from there, all right, let's have them as an elder, you know, he's young, not experienced. And I'm not saying there is anything wrong with this, but let's encourage them not just to know what, how church works, but what the relationship with God is all about and experience what conversion is all about. There was a time in my life when that happened, and I had to cross over. I had to make the change. And uh, so uh, probably we, you, you can, you know, there are people that can identify with this kind of conversion that Sebastian has spoken about, very visible, or that kind of quiet conversion, you know, making the transition. I think it's very important that we all know and understand what, what it means to have a relationship with God. Now, let's go into the story. I'm not going to go into many details. Congo, uh, Sebastian asked you about the movie. I'm going to ask you about another one because now I have more courage. How many of you have seen Blood Diamond? <laughs> very few. All right, that's, that's a very true picture of what Central Africa is all about. Trafficking of diamonds, trafficking of arms. And uh, when we speak about remote places, remote tribes, uh, Sebastian uh, has been to many places where these people had just been discovered and they've been remote because they had not been discovered. 
in Africa, Central Africa, particularly, there are many tribes, many communities that have been re they've, they've, they've been isolated because of their tribal or civil wars. And these people had not been able to be reached. Now, as Sebastian has mentioned, uh, he's entered, we've entered in partnership with a number of churches and we've encouraged people to pray so that the situation in, in the Democratic Republic, uh, Republic of Congo normalizes and we have a window of, of opportunity to enter into Congo. Uh, yeah, actually, you gave me this to use it, isn't it? I was waiting for you to change the slides. <laughs> it was quite difficult to get into the, the country, to get the visas, and actually, we didn't get the visas uh, once we applied, but we managed through, to, to get into Congo through Uganda, and what you see here is where our base is at the moment. It's, it's a town called Butembo in North Kivu province. Now, North Kivu province is one of these provinces where the rebel activities are still uh, very much going on, and this kind of illegal trafficking is taking place. Um, this town was artificially formed because refugees just fled the, the rebels' uh, controlled areas and they came to these hills and they, you know, formed a, a town, a town, a city actually, we could call it by, Europe, uh, by Western uh, standards. 600,000 people live here. Uh, they have no sewage, they have no tarred roads, they have no communication, they have uh, no electricity. Um, this is the team. There were five guys that went into this mission in August last year for three weeks. And these are some of the local um, church leaders and officials that, uh, that assisted us in this mission. This is downtown Butembo. That's what it looks like. And uh, I'm not going to go into this uh, particular story, but... Uh, Let's, whatever we went, we had to, to be very much aware of the uh, safety issue. Congo is a very volatile society, and the smallest conflict could, could spark something very big. And uh, wherever we went, we had to be accompanied by the police or by the military police. And uh, we believe they were there with us to, to, to keep us safe. But probably there was another reason for them to kind of like check on us. What's going on? What are we doing there? And... Um, I was telling you about an instance, and I'm not going to go into details, uh, of when one of our cars was ambushed. We were in the car, and a group of people came to us, and they were very unhappy, and God delivered us from that particular instance. Now, this is how you travel in Batembo. We have some other pictures that we've received recently, and, and it's extremely difficult to get from one place to the other. Uh, it rains all the time. All these roads are very muddy. You need to have a 4x4. And even with a 4x4, it takes you hours to just travel about 20 or 30 kilometers. <clears throat> Initially, our interest was to reach the pygmies that Sebastian spoke about. And uh, as he said, we don't really know exactly how many there are in the jungles of, of Congo. We, we are not really sure exactly what the circumstances that they live under are. We know they... Um, did you mention I wasn't really listening uh, towards the, the end about the ritualistic uh, cannibalism that is practiced. So they, they've been decimated bit by bit. And uh, our concern was these people need to be reached with God's gospel as well. Don't you think so? And uh, you see, we, the passion that drives us is believing that we live in the last days. Amen? Uh, this is our conviction, and the gospel needs to reach, needs to reach every corner of the earth. And the gospel needs to be preached in every tongue, and to every tribe. And uh, if you're wondering how this happens, Sebastian and sometimes myself, just go on the, on the internet or whenever we find out that an isolated tribe or a place that hasn't been reached by the gospel, then we pray about it, and if we feel moved to go there, that's where we go. That's how these missions are born. Uh, initially, we wanted to reach just the pygmies. But, the God gave us, but God gave us a bonus. When we got to Congo, we were told by our, uh, one of the friends that actually has become the coordinator there, Mr. Yang from South Korea, uh, he told us, look, there's another opportunity. We could go and meet some of the Lugwara tribe people, the naked people tribe. They are quite numerous in Congo, but the, the area we're going to, these people had never seen a white man. And we're the first white people to reach that place, um, and uh, we had to travel by, by plane, by charter, and we got there. And then we were received by a very excited crowd. We expected about 50 people. There were about 350 that came to welcome us. Now, we don't have the pictures to show you. Some, many of these pictures had to be censored. You know, we just show you some of the pictures that can be shown in a church. Remember, these are the naked people tribe. 
And uh, even though there were some of our guys that went be before us, ahead of us, and they took some material and some clothing with them, that wasn't really something that they were very interested in. And uh, the moment we arrived, they were very, very friendly, it seemed. I mean, they were friendly, but they were jumping up and down, they were singing, they were dancing. And uh, many ladies were carrying very big pots on their heads. And the guys had spears and bows and arrows with them, and they were very excited to see these white people. And Sebastian and I got closer to each other, and we said, okay, it's supper time. They're very happy. They've got the pots and the spears with them. What's the deal? But uh, that was just for display, and <laughs> uh, we had a very good time with them. Probably I should also mention this. You see, we go to these people. We speak to them, and uh, we tell them who we are, where we come from. Of course, most of this information is irrelevant to them because, I mean, you stand in front of them and tell them, you know, I, I, come, out of, I come from South Africa, or Sebastian, I come from Canada. They probably think we just come, we, we live there, just outside the forest where they came out of because they have no idea of time. They, don't, they have no, no notion of, of uh, geography per se. And uh, every time we go to these places, we speak to these people and we try to assess the needs. Now, we don't have time to go into much detail. It's already quarter past. Can we go just a little bit? All right. The pastor says, go on. I'll, I, I'll, I'll just go with the pastor. And uh, I come from Africa. I could speak forever. I mean, they, time is irrelevant, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to touch on this. Last year, we opened a mission school in Romania where people from around the world, young people, come and are trained specifically for this kind of ministry to remote tribes. Now, this, this training course is just six months. It's, very, uh, it's a very intense course, and uh, uh, it is written as partner, partners in this, in this particular project. And last year, we had 20 people that, that were trained, and out of those 20 people, I'm just very quickly going to mention this, we have two at the North Pole. Sebastian mentioned that already. You see, Sebastian went with the Bibles. They received the Bibles. They were very excited about it. They were able to read in their own language, but they said, look, we don't understand what we're reading. We need someone to come and tell us, to explain to us what we read. So since September last year, we have two young men who are working with us, with the Inuit people. We have three young men. The youngest, I think, is 19. The oldest is 27. And they are in the Amazonian jungles in Peru. And they've been there also from since uh, September last year. And they are doing an amazing work. They, they have wonderful stories. These youngsters, when they come, when, when they get to an internet from time to time and send us the reports, the stories, they're unbelievable. And because the pastor said, I can't, I'm just going to tell you one of these stories. Uh, at one stage, they decided to go by boat. We purchased the boat for them to go on these canals. And they decided to go to one of these, uh, to one of these uh, villages. Now, they, were, they didn't know where they were going. They were just, you know, traveling and hoping that there would be a village. And as they were approaching the shore, one, uh, they, they saw a man standing there and just gesticulating towards them, you know, making all kinds of signs. And as they approached, they realized that it was the, the witch doctor of the village. Now, this is the last guy you want to see. You don't want to be welcomed by the witch doctor of the village. But he was very agitated. They didn't really know <laughs> whether to go on or not, but they, they did reach the place. And as they reached the place, he spoke to them. One of our uh, missionaries speaks uh, Spanish. He said, look, you are two days late. At which they were very baffled. Well, what do you mean? We didn't know we're coming to you. We had other options. How did you know that we're coming to your village? And how can you say that we were, we were two days late when we decided to come this way only today? And then the man said, look, three nights ago I had a dream. And in this particular dream I was walking through a forest. And all of a sudden three insects began to chase me. And I was very unhappy. These are, the, remember, three missionaries. And these three insects just, you know, chased me through the forest. And at one stage I got so upset I turned around. And I, I wanted to use my machete to kill them. At which a bright person stood between me and the insects. And this person said to me, you are forbidden to harm these messengers because they are my messengers. So I've been waiting for you to come with the message. And you are two days late. I can imagine, I mean, what, what this does for them as young Christians and, and as, as missionaries there. We also have at the moment one out of the two missionaries in Congo. Well, I'll show you the pictures. And it's, it's actually quite, quite a story. We sent two. One of them was hit by a truck. We had to pull him out. I'm not going to go into details. The other one contracted malaria. 
We have to pull him out. He's recovering. But then he decided to go back. He wanted to go back. He is back. And he sent us an email with some amazing things that are happening in Congo at the moment. But at the same time, we received news that he is suffering another malaria attack at the moment. And uh, we have four in the Kalahari, men uh, Sebastian mentioned already. Now, uh, yeah, I was telling you about... Uh, this is how I began about this. You see, we go and we speak to these people, but we do realize that we cannot uh, claim that we have evangelized these people. You know, speak to them for two, three days. Maybe if you make an appeal, maybe they will come and they will be baptized. But how much did they really understand? So the training of these missionaries is very specific so that they go into these places for one year. And their main purpose in that one year is to train local, maybe four or five locals, so that these people become evangelists and missionaries to their own people. Amen. This is the most efficient way of spreading the gospel. We don't have the time to just go and spend, you know, five, six, seven years with the pygmies, learn their culture, learn their language, and then, you know, become missionaries to that very small group of people that we can reach. In this way, we can reach much more people and much quicker. Uh, this year, the class of this year, we, we have 13 people. In June, we'll have the graduation, and they will be sent out as well. Now, let's go further into the story. Um, we spoke to the Luguara tribe people. They're very, very excited. At the moment, we have a church there. The church is too small. We receive news. They are just standing outside. We had the baptism of 35 people. A water system was installed there. And, and now people from other tribes from across the river come to this place to get fresh water. Uh, plans for a clinic and a school are being in process, uh, are, are, you know, uh, progress. And uh, a number of, of camps of pygmies, pygmies have been reached as well. I'll, I'll just show you. Again, we don't have the details, uh, we don't have the time to go into details, but what we have discovered is that uh, the need in, in Congo is great. Friends, I mean, we said we met 350 Luguara tribe people. There are over 110,000 in that place. There's, because of the, the conflict that, that, we've, that, that they've been through for so many years, there's so much suspicion, there's so much fear, there's so much pain on the faces of these people. Just look at them. Children don't really know exactly how to laugh. Look at that grim on that, that child's face. He's trying to smile at the camera. This old man is really not really, I mean, uh, to be able to go to such people and to tell them God loves you. And then, of course, raise the question, how come this God loves us? Look what's happening to us. But then to explain how, how sin came into this world, who is responsible for this, how God himself came to this earth to die for them. And that he's preparing a better place where there's no conflict, there's no war, there's no suffering, there's no pain. Uh, and, and to see a spark of hope starting to shine in those people's eyes. My friends, that's the biggest reward we could have. We have sacrificed a lot. And uh, there are many things that we, we could say. But I'm telling you every single time that we have this chance to go into these places and to see that spark of hope come into those people's eyes. And, and that belief being born in their hearts, that's, that's reward enough for us. The chiefs of tribes are exchanging gifts there. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go through the pictures very quickly. Now, uh, the Bambuti Pygmy tribes, uh, we reached a number of camps. They live in the jungles, and our purpose is to go through the missionaries and reach them where they live. But now there are some camps that have been organized. They come out of the jungles, and we're able to meet them. And I'm just going to show you the circumstances that are present in the camps, which are supposed to be, you know, better villages, better living conditions. The huts they live in are very similar to those of the Bushmen. And uh, as you can see, they are very, very small. The pygmies, their height is one meter, one meter ten. So they're very, very short. We're also very, uh, we had a beautiful welcome from, they, from them as well. The women they work extremely, extremely hard. We were so amazed. You know, to, at one stage, it becomes embarrassing to take pictures when you see what those people are going through. I mean, you can't just go in front of a woman that is carrying a lot of 30 kilograms on her back and, you know, carrying two children on, on, on her arms and let me take a picture of you so that I can show you somewhere. Uh, really, I, I mean, it's... And again, just look at the expression on, on, on these people's faces. These are, this is a village we went to, and because of what Sebastian had mentioned to you a bit earlier on, there are about four or five men left in the entire village. Just to have an idea of uh, their size... These are older men. 
Well, compared to Sebastian, I, I, I think that uh, if I stand next to him, I'd look like a pygmy. I, I felt very good with the pygmies there. I felt very tall. Wherever I go with this, I'm not going to call him the beast, but this giant, I mean, I, I feel so small. With the pygmies, I feel, look at that, I'm tall. <laughs> We're able to preach to them. Also, another method of evangelism that we enjoy very much, just kicking a ball around with them. Many times coming, you know, not, not, uh, we, we think that we are very good at this sport, but, you know, sometimes we are a bit humbled. Uh, I'm going to show you now one of the most, actually the most advanced clinic in Aloya camp, camp in Congo, in North Kivu. This is one of the Adventist volunteer doctors. And this is what one of the rooms looked like. This man was sick of malaria. And he was being treated. His family was visiting with him. This is the surgery room, friends. And the doctor was telling me, we're walking, and he said, Dan, you know, sometimes people come here with a headache or maybe some malaria, and because we have no ways of sterilizing the equipment, they live with AIDS. And this is a school. And these are the two missionaries I was telling you about uh, uh, who went to, to Congo. This is Gabriel. He's still there now, and he's the one who contracted malaria, and this is David. He, uh, he's the one who was hit by a truck, and he's uh, still back in Romania. I'd like to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share this, uh, this, this story, these stories with you. And once again, I'd like to, to, to mention this to you. Everything that we see, dear friends, it is our purpose that what we present to you is an encouragement to every single one of us. The gospel is being preached. The Holy Spirit is at work. And the same Holy Spirit that is at work in those places is at work in our hearts and in our lives. And I don't know what kind of week you've had and what kind of experiences you are going through. But remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where we said, let's not look at the seen things. We might get discouraged and depressed. Let's look at the unseen and be encouraged by God's power and His love. Amen. We want to thank you for having us this Sabbath. It's been a great pleasure to be here. We apologize for the delay in time. Um, we know that at 12.15 you usually finish. However, seeing that you might not see us again, we managed to uh, really go uh, over time. Uh, uh, that, you know, you don't have, you can't do anything to us anyway. We're going to disappear in for two minutes. <laughs> Uh, we have another appointment at 2 o'clock deep in the city, so uh, uh, those of you that want more information or you want to contact us, you saw our website there, pilgrimsociety.com. In case you want to know more information as well, we have some cards we can give it to you as we come out. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Have a, 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 an excellent Sabbath, and thank you very much for everything. Amen. <laughs>